it's obvious, blatantly obvious. I'll tell you kind of how it kind of hit me. I was in Mexico with our team. Uh, and so we, had, we took five people to Mexico. It was fun. It was great. It was awesome. We had a wonderful time. And so as we were coming back across the border, of course, my cell phone did not work when I was in Mexico. I have like zero roaming or whatever that was. And uh, so my phone did not work. Nothing. No data. No nothing. And, and it was a bummer because it was Father's Day. So I missed out on my kids saying, you know, happy Father's Day. So I was kind of bummed by, by that. So, but when I came across the border, or actually right before we went across the border, my cell phone kind of popped up, right? So I thought, oh, you know, so you got to go through the routine, which for me, the routine is Bleacher Report, Facebook, email. That's the priority. Every time I pop my phone on, that's where I go first. Bleacher Report, which is all my sports, Facebook, which is all my social media, and then email, which is some work stuff, right? So I go to Bleacher Report, and I realize the Lakers pick somebody that I don't like. Not that I didn't like, but I wanted to pick somewhere else. I'm like, oh, man. So I'm already disappointed. Coming across the border, I'm like, oh, this stinks. Hopefully my kids left me a voicemail of a Father's Day thing. So then I go to social media. And of course, dude, it blows up. Like, and I'm, I'm like, whoa, it's got all these notifications and all this stuff's going on. I've been gone for eight days. And so I start reading them and I'm like, wow, wow. And this guy in his van is like, dude, did you hear? 5-4 decision. They've delegalized same-sex marriage across the nation. And I'm like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, Supreme Court made a decision. I didn't even know the Supreme Court was talking about this. Like, what happened? Well, of course, I was in Mexico, so apparently when I leave, that's when the Supreme Court does its thing, because they know I'm a heavy influencer. So they had to get me out of it. No, I'm just kidding. And so, man, I'm in the car, and I have mixed emotions. First, I'm kind of frustrated about the Lakers, but that starts to subside. And then I start to think, man, what does this mean? Okay, and then these two things kind of collided, right? They kind of collided. My love of sports... Right? And then what's going on with our nation? They collided in Bruce Jenner, Caitlyn Jenner. Right? And so then I watched the, the, the ESPYs. So I'm watching a show that's awarding athletes for their achievements. And Bruce Jenner, if you don't know, um, was an Olympic athlete. Just an amazing athlete. Came in as a favorite. Lost four years before, but came in as a favorite and just dominated. And, and before even the last race, I mean, he, he would have to get like dead last to lose. I mean, he was so far ahead. The guy just a dominant Olympic performance uh, for the ages. And so I respect athletes. I do. I love sports. I always have. But then watching him on stage present himself as not Bruce Jenner, the athlete, but Caitlyn Jenner, the female. And I'm telling you, I was sitting on my couch and I, was, I watched it almost three times, like all the way through. I, I had to stop the third time because my, my kids came in the room and I didn't really want to have to walk through what this meant. We'll get that, they'll get that conversation. But I just sat there and to be honest, the first emotion I felt was just sad. It was sad. Because this guy who I respect, I mean, a ton, man, a ton. And then I'm watching this and I'm just, you know, inside of me, I'm just sad. I feel like he's made a couple decisions that aren't going to lead to a sense of identity, a sense of worth and significance, but they're going to lead um, to disorder in his life. And that saddens me. You know, that's, that just saddens me. And so, it has become very apparent. I mean, you can watch TV, social media, uh, anything, that there is a growing tension. To me, it feels like, as somebody who's been on this earth for 31 years, it, to me, than it's ever been before. I mean, we've got the celebration of abortion, right? This systematic, in my opinion, murdering of human life that happens in the hundreds and thousands every year, right, in America. Then we have this transgender kind of agenda that's happening, and, and I've noticed, even in student ministry, I just spoke at a student ministries camp Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and even speaking with students there, and students are asking questions that I never asked when I was in junior high. Like asking questions, what am I? Am I a man or a woman? Like those questions, I don't know about you, but dude, when I was in junior high, I was not asking that question. I was, one, I was not a deep thinker. I just never asked that question. And that's what students are going through right now. And of course, the Caitlyn Jenner issue, of course, the same-sex marriage issue. There is a huge tension 
in between what culture is presenting and what the Christian church has stood for. And the sad thing is, as there's friction and there's tension, what comes out are these sparks, right? You know this. Anytime there's tension or friction, there's sparks. You apply the brakes, right? There's sparks. And so heat comes out. People are offended. Emotions come out, right? Posts become really like, like a social media gun. And you're aiming at just a mass audience of people you don't even know, affecting them in an emotional way that you aren't, aren't even aware of, but you feel like you have to release and vent your emotions in the most broad scope, right? That's what Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff has become. And, and, and you see that, and that saddens me too. The tension, right, of where the culture is going, but then the friction you see, and then from both sides, just, it seems like a complete kind of misunderstanding where people are, right? And an intolerance on both sides. Intolerance, just to be clear, implies disagreement, right? When you are tolerant of somebody, you, it implies that you disagree with that person, Right? What we see, these sparks we see that come out in these social media quotes and these 122 characters of whatever are honestly probably the saddest part of everything. So what we're going to try to answer is, well, what do we do then? Like, how are we to respond? And so what we're going to do tonight, I want to be very clear what tonight is and what the rest of the weeks are going to be. Tonight, I'm giving you, think of it like glasses. I'm giving you glasses. We're going to start on the very foundation. We're going to walk slowly through each of these different issues. But before we start, we need a foundation. We need to know how should a Christian view culture? Culture out here. What, what should I look, when I look at it, how should I see it? Should I completely separate myself from it? And say it's all worldliness, it's all bad, it's all evil. I need to go over here and, and listen to Christian music, play Christian bingo with my Christian friends in a Christian way. Right? Or is it the other end? I should just be so over here in culture, doing everything, dress the way they tell me to dress, act the way they tell me to ask or act, right? Ask the same identity questions that everybody else is asking. So how should we view culture and when should we enter in and when should we find ourselves outside of culture? That's what we're gonna talk about. And really it breaks down into the three little things that we've said: rejoice, reject, and redeem. Rejoice, reject, and redeem. So as we walk through this, what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to show you why these are the three postures we should have. Rejoice, reject, and redeem. When we look at culture, this is how we should respond in one of these three ways. Then I'm going to show you how that looks like. I'll show you with the Apostle Paul and how he dealt with culture. And I'm going to pick two specific issues at the end of the tonight and show you how I would respond with this kind of paradigm of rejoice, reject, and redeem. So let's start. Rejoice. Rejoice. You can look down in your outline and you'll see in there there's a bunch of notes. You can take notes there. There's life group questions in there. And those are helpful for you to kind of walk through. But let's just start with rejoice. Rejoice. Now, why should we rejoice? And when we talk about culture, this is how the definition I want to use. There are a thousand definitions of culture, man, there's a ton. And I waded through a lot of these, this, these, these definitions. Culture is basically a shared understanding that's expressed. This is what that means, okay? I don't want you to think culture, what sometimes when Christians do in this discussion is they hear the word culture and they say every time the, wor the, the word culture world appears in the Bible. That's what it means. Okay? So in 1 John, when it says, don't be worldly, he's saying, don't be cultural. You can't think of culture as evil in and of itself. Like when I talk about African culture versus Swedish culture, okay, am I implying, oh, that's culture, that's evil. Christians should not be a part of that. No, there are African Christians. There are Swedish Christians. And they're going to talk different, pray different, and do different things. They're going to express themselves in different ways, and that's okay. So culture means the shared understanding that is expressed. We could even say the culture of illuminate. We have a culture, we have a shared understanding that we express. Like right now, you sitting down 
is an expression of culture. We have a shared understanding that right now it's time for the guy on stage to talk and for you to sit down and take notes. When Sergio comes up here, we have the shared understanding that when he's up here, we want you to participate. So you stand up and you sing, but you don't stand up and sing right now. We have a shared understanding that's expressed in an appropriate way. That's what culture is. So how should we look at culture, the shared understanding expressed? Go to Genesis chapter one, where it starts. I think we need to rejoice in culture. We need to rejoice. Now you can't isolate these three from each other. Rejoice, reject, and redeem, okay? But let me show you why we should rejoice. Genesis chapter one, I'm gonna hop around a lot, but there's this pattern that is overwhelming in Genesis chapter one. In Genesis chapter one, verse three, sorry, verse four, God creates light, and he says in verse four, God saw the light, and he said it was good. Then if you jump down to verse 10, God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called the sea. God saw that it was good. In verse 12 of Genesis chapter one, God starts bringing up trees, the trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Jump then to verse 18. God separates the light from the darkness, makes day and night, and says God saw that it was good. Verse 21, God again steps in here and he starts to create things that, that winged birds and animals that swim. And he said, God saw that it was good. Again, God creates again, things that creep on the ground, right? This is, this is like cattle, this is what God makes. And it says, God saw that it was good. God makes good things, right? God's a good God, which means he makes good things. If you're a craftsman, Right? And your job is to build a table. Judging by the table, I can tell how you are as a craftsman. If you're a terrible craftsman, your table's going to have like five legs and a corner that's edged up over here, and it's going to be awful. If you're a good craftsman, what are you going to do? You're going to build a great table. So if God is a good God, a good creator, what is he going to make? Good things. So there is good in creation. And there's a good in us. God made us good. Not defaulty, not damaged. God made us good. Now, some people will say, okay, now hold on. Those that would say we should totally be against culture, always reject culture. They'll say that was Genesis 1, but Genesis 3 happens, and Genesis 3 is the story of the fall. Right, where man decides to rebel against his creator and go off and do his own thing. And really that rebellion is man wanted to be like God. So they're like, God, you're not doing a great job. We want to make the rules, so we're going to go off on sin. And that rebellion happened, and sin just destroyed everything. So people would say, there's no more good in culture since Genesis chapter 3. Once we fell, everything fell. So yes, there was good in creation, there was good in culture, but it just fell away. The question is, does the Bible look at culture that way? No, it doesn't. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Paul, again, is talking about God's creation, and this is what he says in verse 19 of Romans chapter 1. It says, what can be made known about God is plain to them. Them as being the audience of the world. So what's to be known about God is made plain to the world because he has shown it to them. How has God shown who he is to the world? Verse 20, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things he has made. What does Paul say? Paul says, dude, when I look at creation, creation shows me God. So if everything in creation is evil, how would it show God? And some people say, well, it shows the justice of God. It shows the righteous anger and indignation of God. But those aren't the things that are listed. He says, if you want to know something about God, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature, you can see that when you look at creation. So the good in creation wasn't completely lost. It's still there. It is outside but it's also inside. You just flip to the next chapter in Romans chapter two. 
there's not only good in the outside, there's not only good in seeing trees, good in seeing grass, good in seeing the sky. Not only those things show God, but there's good in you. There's good in us. There's good in people who don't go to church. There's good in people who aren't Christians. Now let me show you that. This is Romans chapter 2, verse 14. It says, for when the Gentiles, this would be non-Jewish people, and in this context, he's talking about people who don't believe in God. For when Gentiles who do not have the law, which he's talking about there is the Ten Commandments, or for us, it'd be like the Bible. People who don't have the Bible, people who don't have the Ten Commandments, which means they're, they're just not believers, right? They're, they're not in the community of God that we would call his people. They're outside that. But look what they do. They do not have the law by nature do what the law requires. They are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the law or the work of the law is written in their hearts where their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse and even excuse them. Look what he just said in verse 14. By nature inside of you there is a law and it says they do what the law requires. What do you call it when you obey the law? Good. So we do good. There's still good in us. Now before we walk too far into that, you get to Romans chapter 3. Paul says nobody is righteous. There's a difference between good and righteous. Okay? Righteous means 100% acceptable to God. This act right here is pure in its motives, in its thought, and in its action. So God would give that a thumbs up. Paul would say in this book that we are not righteous, meaning we are not 100% good. The acts we do, nothing we do is 100% pure. But does that mean we are all Adolf Hitler? Does that mean we, everything we do is utterly evil? Right, before we're Christian, is everything you did 100% as evil as it can be? No. You do good, but it's nothing you do that good is ever 100% pure. So can we rejoice in culture? When we look out, can we rejoice? Absolutely. Because there's good in creation and there's still good in us. A good example of this is art. Art is beautiful, right? A good, another good example is technology, right? This is beautiful, right? If it was bigger, it'd even be better. That's what guys say, right? Hey, man, 55-inch screen, yo, that's beautiful. You can rejoice in that. This is the most important one, sports. Yes. Come on. Yes, you can rejoice in that. Spiking a football in an end zone, which a bunch of dudes on the other side of the team want to get you and tackle you and drop you down and hurt you, and you run 100 yards and you score. Bro, rejoice. Now, I'm not saying you got to slam the football down and be like, oh, thank you, Jesus. No, you don't have to make it church. You don't have to make the end zone church, but you rejoice. Why? Because that is a good thing. Achievement is a good thing. Courage is a good thing. Work is a good thing. Team is a good thing. Those are good things. Okay, I'll give you an example of this. We kind of ran into this when we, my wife and I were uh, in Vegas. We were on a vacation, right? And so we were excited and my wife and I, we got to get away. It was a crazy, crazy season before we got there. It was just crazy, super busy. And um, so my... um, uh, mother-in-law took the kids and we went to Vegas. And so we asked some friends like, hey, we want to know where, what we should do, what we should check out. We, you know, we don't have kids. Man, we could, we could just go all these places. And so we said, we either want to go to the Hoover Dam or the Grand Canyon. And I didn't know, this like started a debate. You know, this is why you don't ask questions on Facebook because drama just comes out. You just put some on Facebook, drama's about to be vomited all over your Facebook. So this huge debate started, and this is what it started over. This is so funny. You know, one person was like, well, you know, do you want to look at what man created or what God created? And I was like, oh, you're the Christian that I want to punch in the face, <laughs> right? And, and I'll give you, this is my honest response. I was like, you know what? I want to see the Hoover Dam. I do. I know God created the Grand Canyon, and that's cool. And it's cool. 
But dude, I went to the Hoover Dam and I was geeking out, man. I mean, we went on the extended tour. I paid extra money. We're going to these places and the, there's like a middle piece of the dam and you can walk, walk in and you're looking down and you freak out. You think you're going to fall over. It's awesome. And you, you read about the history. And my wife and I are geeks when it comes to that stuff. My wife read, reads every single plaque ever. If there's ever a plaque she has to read it. It takes forever to get through a museum. She's reading everything. I'm like, just look at the picture. Just look at the picture, right? So when I went to the Hoover Dam, like I was awestruck by the achievement. And I love that. My wife and I, we just love to go to that stuff. Now, in rejoicing over that achievement, did they build a church? No, it has nothing to do with the church. But in seeing that great achievement, you know what that made me think of? Man, God is amazing. God made man who made that. And I'm amazed that man can make this. I mean, that just blows me away, the feat of making this giant. It's incredible. How much more incredible is the God who made that man? I mean, if the paintbrush can do amazing things, surely the painter is just incredible. See, we can't just separate these two things. God made us. Every musical or or cinematic achievement in some way shows the good of God's creation, even if it's not a Christian film. And we should rejoice with that. What we often do sometimes as Christians, is we just boycott it. Anything that's not by Jesus, we boycott. I remember doing this, dude, when I was like in junior high. I only rooted for the Christian athletes on the Christian team who, made, who prayed before the touchdown. Come on, that's ridiculous. There are no Christian teams. They all cheat. They're all on performance-hancing drugs. Okay, let's be honest. Okay, if you're a baseball fan, everybody was doping up. All those World Series mean nothing. Okay, except for the ones the Giants won. All the other ones just don't mean anything. We have to rejoice in creation. And we have to rejoice in God's creatures. But we also have to reject Because yes, there is good in God's creation, but there is also corruption in God's creation. And that's not hard to find in the Bible, right? You look at the same chapter, Romans chapter one. When God shows how good he is in creation, look what happens. Okay, verse 20, I was talking about God showing his invisible attributes, his eternal powers, divine nature clearly perceived. But you pick up in verse 21, it says, though, and and for although they knew God, they did not honor God. Now look what happens. Look what happens. Look at the the trend that happens. When they reject God, look what happens to them. Look what happens to them. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. So in doing that, they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles and in our modern era ourselves. Right? We reject the creator and worship the creature. Right? We let God not being the determining factor and we are now self-determined. I'll be a man and a woman if I wanted to. It doesn't matter what God called me and made me. I determine who I am. So when you reject God, it affects your thinking. It affects your practice. And it affects God's relationship to you in verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonoring their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. God just keeps giving up. Their thinking is messed up. So the good that was in creation, the good that was in us, is corrupted. It's corrupted good, right? And this is pretty easy when you walk through the Bible to find. I'm gonna give you an example. In 1 Timothy chapter three, it talks about clothing. 1 Timothy chapter two, sorry, verse nine says this. Likewise, also women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for a woman who professes godliness with good works. This is a perfect example of reject. Perfect example is modesty. Right? Are women God's creation? Yes. Are they good? Yes. 
Is it good for you to be attractive? Yes. Are you supposed to attract the opposite sex? Yes. Are you supposed to have a relationship? Yes. But do you accept all of those different definitions as the culture defines them? No. All right, Paul says right here, you've got to be modest the way you dress. And he basically says, when you dress, does it call attention to your posterior or to your principles? Right? To your godliness or your gluteus maximus? That's what he's saying. And think about that. Right? We just can't accept the world's definition of beauty. Now, there is something in what they're saying that is true. There is a good in there that we can rejoice in. But honestly, the culture's definition of beauty is severely corrupted. Because you know what beauty means? I mean, this is what it means to me when I see it on the shelf. When I'm walking through Safeway or Vons or whatever, every time I see a magazine that talks about beauty, it shows a woman's body opposite of the scars of childbearing. And that really bothers me. Right? Airbrush the stretch marks. Right? Airbrush all of that stuff out. Because that is not beautiful. That's a lie. That is a lie. And what I think it's doing is we're perpetuating this idea of female singleness and an absence of beautiful motherhood. Which is, which is recommended and, and promoted in an amazing way in the scriptures. And really, the, the woman pursuit of beauty is about just stay thin enough, right? Keep the measurements right. And let me tell you, a baby messes all that stuff up, man. But then it's about how to get the baby weight off, right? You see those men, how to lose, how to get up. Dude, are all we saying to women is it's how much you weigh that is your worth, That is a sacrifice made to the idol of idolatry and lust. That's what that is. And it should be utterly refuted and pushed away by women and by men. Right, but the male culture worships at that shrine through pornography. And the women worship at that shrine through everything they buy when they go to the mall. And you're perpetuating this idea, my worth is my waistline, my worth is my measurements, my worth is my bra size, my worth is how good I look in my lingerie, right? And men, that's what we focus on. That's what the calendar's on, that's what the, the you know, um, Sports Illustrated swimsuit, you don't see any of that stuff of modest women, right? But isn't that what the Bible tells us? And the same thing is true for men. First Corinthians 11 tells us that men should dress in a masculine way. All of 1 Corinthians is about that, proper dress. There is a way to dress masculine. Now, I'm not telling you you've got to burn your skinny jeans. But I am telling you, you should look at yourself and say, what am I showing? Is this masculine? When people in the culture look at me, do they think masculinity? Now, I'm not saying pump and iron, right, and veins popping out of your neck or something like that and steroids. I'm not saying that. That's, that's a falsehood of what masculinity is. But when they look at you, do they think this is, this is a man? Right? 1 Corinthians 11 would be, go directly against any form of cross-dressing. Right? But you know, man, you look at culture and you see this blending. I've seen it. Dude. I did student ministry. And there are times where, like, you, you know, kids would, like, bring their luggage and it would open. You know what I mean? You're at camp and you're picking stuff up. You're like, this has got to be. So one of the girls lost her luggage. And the guy's like, no, that's mine. Like, yo, bro, you got to chill on the V-necks, man. Like, stop this. And these, dude, you're like, you're huge, and these are all smalls, bro. You need to like, what is going on here? Okay, it's true. There's a difference. There's a difference, and we should respect that difference. We just can't accept culture. We can't accept it. There is no Christian form of pornography. Right, we have to reject that. There's no Christian form of friends with benefits. And we have to reject that. Now, this is the important one. This is the third one. I mean, they're all important. I think you know those two, maybe. Oftentimes, what we focus on is always the reject. Reject, reject, push away, push away. Right, what hurts me the most, the hardest reject for me is good TV and movies because I love stories. I do. I love character-driven shows, but every show is just too much, and I'm like, I can't, I can't do it. So my wife and I will start seasons, and we'll get there, and we're like, oh, we've heard this is really good, and then we're like, I can't watch it anymore. It's just too much, and I can't do it, and that's happening more and more and more. 
But I think sometimes we forget the third one, which is redeem. This needs to be the most active one, in my opinion. Now, check this out. I think this is going to blow your mind. Because in all these kind of cultural conversations, there are people who are too heavy on the rejoice side, like accept everything in culture, accept everything. There's no reason to ever not be on Instagram. Right? There's no reason to ever not be on this. Like, I reject Instagram. I don't have an Instagram. I have one. I never use it. I delete it off my phone. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it. And the reason I couldn't stand it, I'm not saying you're in sin if you're on Instagram. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, you, there's a button in the middle that just shows you, like, random photos. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you go and you can see your friends, but then you, I haven't been on it in forever. But on my app, you can hit something and then it pops up stuff. And that stuff would pop up and I'd be like, what is this stuff? I don't know any of these people. And this is not appropriate. I'm sorry, I don't want to see that. Right? And then I got depressed from all my students like posting stuff on Instagram. And I'm like, I can't handle that anymore. I'm just, I need to reject this. This is not good. I'm not going to like and be your friend when all you're going to do is show your sin and call yourself a Christian. I just, I'm not going to be a part of celebrating that by being your friend and following you in that. So I'm just going to totally back away from that. There are things we have to reject in culture. But there are things we can redeem in culture. Check this out. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Just, just watch this, man. I love, this is one of my favorite passages in this whole conversation. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Look at how there is reject and redeem in this passage right here. This is so cool. All of them are actually in this passage. Rejoice, reject, redeem. Check this out. Verse 22. It says, for the Jews demand a sign. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Demand a sign, which means miraculous power. That's what that means. The Greeks seek wisdom. Okay, so Paul's saying there are these two audiences, and their pursuit is the Jews want to see miraculous power through science. The Greeks want to see wisdom, truth, philosophical, you know, just, just appraised knowledge. That's what they want. But, and this would be the reject part, what does Paul do? He says, you know what I give him? I give him Christ crucified. And that's a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. Now, what we can't do is stop there. We can't stop there. And as a church, we can't stop there. Look at what Paul says right after this. But to those who are called, means to those who have responded to this Christ, both Jews and Greeks, check this out, remember what they wanted. The Jews wanted power, miraculous signs. The Greeks wanted wisdom, astute truth, right? This is what he says. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Do you see what he did there? He basically said the Jews and the Greeks were on this path inside of them. One wanted power, one wanted truth and wisdom. And he said, you know what I presented to them? I pushed forward Christ. And what did they find in Christ? The power that they sought after and the wisdom that they were looking for. This is redeem. This is redeem. There is good in our culture. There is good to be found in creation. There's good to be found in us as creatures. But it's not completely good, it's corrupted. So we must reject parts of it. But we should use it to redeem it, bring people back, use culture to glorify God, just as Paul did right there. There's a famous theologian and pastor, his name is Francis Schaeffer. In an email, this is what he said. I love this. He said, if I only had an hour with somebody, I would spend the first 55 minutes asking them questions. So that in the last five minutes, I'll have something to say which really speaks to them. Instead of speaking past them, I want to speak to them. This is what Tim Keller says, one of my favorite guys to read. He's a pastor in New York. This is what he says. He says, we have to show our listeners that their plot lines, he's talking their story, wherever somebody's story is, however it started, we have to show them that that plot line, the direction of their story, the plot lines of their lives can only find resolution or what he calls a happy ending in Jesus. We must retell the culture story in Jesus. And this is exactly what Paul does. And this is what we miss when we just fight about rejoice and reject. 
where we argue about what's good, what's corrupted, what's good, what's corrupted. If all we do is find ourselves in that debate, we miss redeem. We miss taking that good and saying that good is great, but it could be better. We forget that our story started with God as our father and our creator. And that inside us there is a natural law, natural desire. There is a cultural story and plot line that I think is given by God, distorted by sin, but will find its happy ending in Jesus. And instead of just beating somebody up on their cultural narrative and saying, what's bad, what's good, what's bad, just take the good and show them how it finds its happy ending in Jesus Christ. Shortly, let me show you how Paul does this. Acts chapter 17, think about rejoice, reject, and redeem. Paul walks into this city, people who have never heard about Jesus. And as he walks in, this is his speech to them. I'm just going to read you the speech and think of rejoice, reject, redeem. He says, men of Athens, this is Acts chapter 22. Or sorry, Acts chapter 17, verse 22. Men of Athens, I perceive in every way you are very religious. Maybe this is rejoice. He's finding something good in that culture. For as I passed alongside, I observed the objects of your worship. And I found also an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. This is good here, right? There's good in here because he's saying, you don't know something about the creator you're trying to worship. You don't know something about God. That's good to embrace. And then he rejects. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man like you're trying to do, nor is he served by human hands like you're trying to do, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all mankind life, breath, and everything in it. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their allotted periods and their boundaries of their places, that they should seek God and hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Now this is a big rejoice. Check this out. This is in verse 28. Yet he is actually not far away from each one of us. For, and in my Bible there are two quotes there. In him we live and move and have our being. The second quote says, for we are indeed his offspring. Those are not quotes from the Bible. Those are not quotes from Christians. Those are quotes from poets, Greek poets. Because Paul says in the middle of those quotes, as even some of your own poets have said, check out what he did. Paul walks into this scene with his glasses on of rejoice, reject, redeem. And he sees in them, I know there's something in you. You think that God is not far from you. You think in a sense that you are sons of God, that there's some imprint of God on you. But you also see that you don't know something about God. So let me take this good, let me take this plot line that started here. It got corrupted into idolatry, corrupted into this wrong view of God, which he rejects. But then he says, let me show you how close you are and where you need to go. He says in verse 29, but then God, God's offspring, we ought not to think that divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art of imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Did he lighten the gospel? Did he take away what the Christian message is? No. He just showed them, this is the happy ending you've been looking for. Now let's just apply that. Just straight out, let's apply this. Let's say the one that struck me the most, the Caitlyn Jenner situation. Now this is incredibly important. And there's a reason on the logo we put rejoice, reject, redeem in that order. This is what I believe. If you want to be successful in working through this cultural tension, do me a favor. Start with rejoice. Don't start with reject. They know that already, right? Don't they? Don't people in the culture, they've heard that message run over and over and over again. Every parade we pick it. Right? There's always some crazy guy with a megaphone yelling about how they're going to hell. We've said reject. But who has said rejoice? So let's take the Caitlyn Jenner situation. This is a hard one. Okay? As I was sitting there looking at this play out on my TV, a guy who I consider a hero of mine, a guy who just put a ton of effort to making this achievement and is now seeing himself in the wrong gender, 
what he would call the right gender, the true gender for himself. Where's the good in that? Now that's hard to find. It's hard in all of that mixture to find it. This is where I think the good is. As I was watching that uh, film and that, that they did a documentary and then he spoke, this is what he said in the documentary that kind of just blew my mind. He said, you know, I was always feeling that I had these secrets, that I wasn't who I really was. Not a direct quote. The secrets part was. But I wasn't who I really was. And he was searching for his identity. So he's basically asking the question, who am I really? Okay, that's where we start. Bruce, that's a great question. Bruce, you're feeling right now that you don't know who you are, where you are. If you're a man or a woman, that feeling is a feeling that every single person has felt on the face of this earth and should feel. We should feel lost. Jesus says in Luke chapter 15, when he describes humanity, he says, it's like a lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost son. We have all estranged ourselves from our father who we find our identity in, and we are all lost. And in Acts chapter 17, God has put us in the spot, and he's hoping that we find our way out. So this idea of exploration, God, who am I? That's a good question. But Bruce, this is the part we have to reject, Bruce. You went along this, this path thinking that you defined yourself. You determined yourself. And Bruce, that's where you missed it. You should ask the question, yes, what am I? Who am I? What's my true identity? Bruce, your true identity is found in Psalms 139, where God said that he took your DNA and wove it together in your mother's womb. He determined you, spoke definition into you, significance and identity. He made you a strong man. And he wants you to be his son. So Bruce, what I'm afraid that you will find, or Caitlin, what I'm afraid you will find is your path to self-definition will lead to self-ruin. And I don't want that. And that's why that saddens me. Think of a live-in couple, okay? A couple who, who loves each other and they're, they're living together. And they're having sex together, boyfriend and girlfriend. Like, let's not even go into um, gay or lesbian or anything like that. Let's just say a heterosexual couple. Where do you start with them? Again, I think rejoice. I think you go in and you say, you know what? You looking for love is a good thing. You being attracted to one another, that's a great thing. God created us and shows that it's good, and it's good for you to call it good. It's good for you to call it sexually good. It's good for you to call it sexually arousing. It is okay for a man to look at a woman and be aroused. That's how God made us, right? The first things we say when we see a woman are like, wow, man, that's awesome. Then she became woman, right? That's the idea. So this is good. Your, Your companionship, your attraction, your intimacy is good. But God's plan, this is your reject part, God's plan is to have commitment and then intimacy. And not intimacy and then commitment. Because the true nature of intimacy finds itself in commitment. The surety that you will, for better or for worse, never divide yourself from this person. You want to be intimate, pledge your life to somebody. That's a level of genuine intimacy that God wants and that's what's best for marriage. But you don't even stop there. You rejoice with them over their attraction, love for another. You said, God wants to reject this idea of intimacy, then commitment. You say, you gotta switch that around, be committed and then be intimate. But where's the redeemed? Guys, you know what God wants to do with your relationship? Do you know what he wants to do with your, him loving you, you loving him, you becoming one flesh? You know what he wants to do? He wants to highlight the gospel message on your relationship. He wants when people look at you to see his gospel love in Jesus Christ. Not to just shine the ooey gooey, not just be like, oh, look how much they're in love, but to see, wow, look at that love. Look at that sacrificial love. That's the love that God has for us. That's rejoice, reject, redeem. This is the glasses, this is the lens, this is the foundation. We're going to look at every single cultural issue as we walk through these next several weeks. Now, this is important because maybe you're here and, and, and you don't understand that when God looks at you, he looks at you through this same way. And that's rejoice, reject, and redeem. That when God looked at you, he saw something he created. But then he saw something that he lost. 
and we ran away into ruin and God rejects that sin, but he redeems and says, you are precious to me, yet you've damaged yourself and your sin, but I want you back. He redeems us through his son. Our view of culture is really the same way that God viewed all of humanity in sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. And if you're not at that point yet where you have seen Jesus as the remedy for your sin, we invite you to make a decision tonight to do that.